Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11059 Statutory Interpretation. We're into week five of Term 3, 2018. Thank you all for joining me. I appreciate your attendance for the live session. For those of you watching the recorded session, please consider joining us live. And um, it's an opportunity for you to engage in some discussions. So tonight we um, will cover intention and interpretive techniques this is chapter five of your text, Michelle Sanson. We're going to uh, deal with a couple of problems that might assist you in terms of preparing for your final assessment. And uh, to do that, I'll look at the assessment from last year, term three, where um, some of the work was uh, relevant directly to the work that we're dealing with this week. Now, before I start, are there any questions, comments? Has anyone got anything that they wish to add? ask all good all right so those of you that are watching this as a live session i assume you're in the group that have already submitted your work for the first assessment which is due this evening the 12th of, sorry tomorrow which is the 13th of december is that correct you've presented your work already good okay without giving any indication as to the detail how did you go with the assessment pretty easy task all good all right, so if um, anyone is watching this as a recorded session and you're struggling, don't be too concerned. It's not meant to be a difficult task for the first assessment. I can't necessarily say that for the third assessment. The briefing paper last year was um, conducted over a short time frame, as I recall, two or maybe three hours. This year, you've got it easy. You've got 29 hours or thereabouts. Um, but the difficult part is that when you have longer, I expect a better standard and you will have access to the internet for your final assessment. So it's not an invigilated examination. And um, I'm happy for you to collaborate with your colleagues in terms of your final assessment. Now, many of your unit coordinators will not adopt that approach. My philosophy is that um, we're here to help each other and that goes as far as the assessment regime as well. Having said that, I need to explain that Mom, this is not an indication, this is not an invitation for you to collude. By collusion, I mean having the, um, taking others' work and trading it as your own. But you are allowed to discuss these matters and to um, consider the material co collectively. So just be careful with that and use that um, ability carefully. So you can understand then that what we're looking at is something where you have an extended period of time to provide your response and you're an opportunity to, to discuss this with others and full access to the internet. So I expect a high standard. Now, in the context of intention and interpretive techniques, you would have noticed the examination from last year included a reference to two cases that feature heavily in this week's material. The first is Maxwell and Murphy, which is 1957-96 CLR 261. And the other is Jaeger against the Crown, 1977-139 CLR 28. Would I be correct in assuming that you are familiar with those cases? That's a yes? All right. And would I also be correct in assuming that you've had a look at the assessment piece, the briefing paper from term three last year, which I've uploaded? Okay. So let's have a look at the first question in the assessment from last year. And um, if you've got that uh, handy, call it up on your screen. Otherwise, I'll just mention what it is. It's in fact drawn directly from your textbook as case example number 5.1 and then 5.2. So if you look at um, exercise 5.2, it's on pages 96 through to 98 inclusive. And that case, or that case example is um, in fact, Maxwell and Murphy. So the author does this very well provide you with a factual scenario, asks you to provide a response from a statutory interpretation uh, technique, 
or perspective rather, and then says, look, here's the real case and this is what the court held. So Maxwell and Murphy is 5.2 and Jaeger and the Crown is 5.1. The question that I set for students last year, bearing in mind they had three hours to provide a response to this and the second question, was analyse Maxwell and Murphy, the case that forms the basis of case example at 96 to 98 of your text. Is this case in accordance with Jaeger against the Crown, the previous case example in your text on page 95? Now, this might be difficult if you haven't read the material or considered it, but does anyone wish to provide any commentary about that question that I set last year? Do you believe that the case of Maxwell and Murphy is in accordance with the decision of Jaeger? And if so, why? Now, bearing in mind that we're upping the ante here tonight, we're getting you more ready for the final exam preparation. So does anyone wish to add any comments, commentary? I know it's a tough one. Mind you, the second question in last year's exam was much more difficult than this one, this essay style question. All right, so let's have a look at perhaps how you might go about answering a question um, where you're to compare, if you like, and analyse questions um, uh, 5.2 and 5.1 in your text. So the question requires you firstly to analyse. If you've done Introduction to Law with me or you're doing that now, you'll be aware that I do ask you to, to pay particular attention to the first word of any question, not just in my units, but any unit generally. And typically you might see that the question asks you to analyse, as is the case in the, the question I've just posed for you now, or to explore, to explain, to contrast, to compare, to interpret. So the first word is important. What that means is that you need to have a dictionary for yourself that explains what is meant by that first word. Now I've prepared some of the, the notes in Introduction to Law to that effect. But to give you an idea, in this instance, when I say analyse the case, what I really look, I'm looking for is for you to explain it, to identify it, but most importantly, to identify hidden features, that is to consider and investigate. That's what I mean by analyse. Different lecturers may have different ideas about this, but the point is, the first word is critical because if you do some, something other than what I've asked, then you can't expect to get the, the sort of answer, uh, the marks that you would do if you answered the question that I've posed. So here we are looking for hidden features we're considering and investigating. Now, if you're going to um, prepare an answer for the question number one that I set in last year's examination, you'd need to consider pages 91 through to 93 of your text. And you'll see there in the text, the courts use different techniques to determine the objective intent of parliament. And that's the theme of tonight's lecture. Courts, in the parliament's intention and um, interpretive techniques. So courts um, will use different techniques to determine the objective intent of parliament. Now, what do I mean by objective intent as opposed to something else, subjective? What do we mean by objective intent? Any thoughts? I told you it was going to be more difficult tonight. So, um, oh. All right, we had a dead heat there. Rhonda. Objective is um, going by um, external sources. So not using your own subjective opinion. It's based on precedent and, and the information, the facts that you've got to make your informed decision. Very good. Nigel, did you want to add something there? No, uh, that covers what I was going to say. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm not sure. Gary, did you have something you wanted to offer as well? All right, good. So, yes. So when we're talking about objective, we're looking at something which is external. Um, a typical example that you'll see, some, well, in, sometimes in your textbooks, is 
a reference from a, an, a quite an old English case to what would a person on the Clapham omnibus have to say about something that was always a he, he happened to see. So the objective um, test is typically designed to think what would an objective observer looking at something have to think about it as opposed to necessarily putting themselves in the mind of the person who actually did this act. I hope that makes sense. So objectivity means that we are contrasting it to the subjective intent of the individual. So what do we glean from that then when we're considering the way in which courts consider the um, intent of parliament? Well, it's an objective test. We're looking at what parliament objectively intended. So we're putting um, fresh eyes to it. We're not necessarily slavishly following the wording that was used by parliament um, or individuals within parliament when the legislation was created. Of course, we rely on it. We consider what, they, uh, what was said in the second reading speech. We consider what was in the explanatory memorandum. They're all very important, but we do so from an objective perspective. So in Maxwell and Murphy, Parliament was silent in relation to a particular issue, that is the potential retrospective liabilities that might apply or would apply on a literal reading. How do courts go about determining intent? Well, they don't do so in a vacuum. They will consider the body of law around this issue. So we're familiar with the concept of courts looking at the entire act, for example, and treating the words within the act within context. But when we're trying to determine the intent of parliament, we look at the context in a different manner. So a different type of context. This is very obscure, but can anyone guess what it is that I'm trying to, um, I'm alluding to when I talk about this wider context within which courts work? when determining the objective intent of parliament. It's very obscure. Can anyone get it? Gary? Can't hear Gary, sorry. Now we can. Just a bit. It's a just a bit faint, Gary. We can hear you, but it's the volume isn't there. How's that? A little better. A little better. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going off the back of uh, Michelle's book. Uh, broad context context involves historical, political, and international um, context of legislation itself. Okay. It was still pretty faint, but I think what you were saying is that you're looking at the flow chart in the textbook by Sanson. Is that correct? All right. Excellent way of doing it. So <clears throat> now we're all, we're all preparing our toolkits, aren't we, for the second assessment? We've got that well started. All right. So having reference to the flow chart is excellent. So when we look at context, we are looking at that broader context. And um, as uh, Sanson says, historical, political, international. Now, when we talk about historical, I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps the most important part of the historical perspective is the common law. And when I talk about common law, I'm also talking about equity. So when courts interpret Parliament's intent, they do so objectively, they do so, do so within that broader context, and they will consider the state of the common law including equity. So when we talk about the retrospective liability, potential retrospective liability, as was a feature of Maxwell and Murphy, we must consider what the common law was and there's a leading case on this. It's called Coco against the Crown. 1994, 179 CLR at 47, sorry, 427. Coco against the crown. When I say the crown, um, that's the long version of just R. So do you understand what I mean there? 
all right, Regina or Rex. The presumption at common law is that unless the, sorry, the, the common law says, unless the presumption of retrospectivity is excluded expressly or by express implication, then it doesn't exist. And Gary said, yes, 179 CLR 427. That's correct. Now, in Jaeger, which was the exercise 5.1, the courts had to consider the purpose of an act within the context of what Parliament had intended. How did they do that? Um, does anyone know the facts of Jaeger? Can anyone tell me briefly the facts of Jaeger's case? That's where she brought the cannabis in on the plane. That's it. And she argued that it was a strain of cannabis that was not listed in the legislation. Exactly. Thank you, Gareth. So that's this is the cannabis case. And um, the courts had to consider the context in which Parliament was working when determining its intent. So the, the court determined that had Parliament been aware of the species of cannabis, it would have sought to prohibit its import. So it came to that conclusion as a result of considering the objective intent. And the objective intent of Parliament was to penalise those people involved in introducing a dangerous drug to the country. So what, from a technical perspective in Jaeger, what did the court do in order to to allow the successful prosecution of Jaeger in this case and deny the defence. What was the, tech, the specific technique that was adopted by the court in order to get round this problem? And Gareth's right about the facts. So what was the technique? I'm being tough on you tonight. Reading in, Tammy, yes. I like your answer. I just didn't like the question at the end of at the end of it. Reading in, that's correct. Yes. So what the, the court did is it read in this additional piece of information that was not there at the start. And it did so because it had regard to the objective intent of Parliament and determined what Parliament would have done had it been aware of the particular circumstances. So these questions then relate to the intent of Parliament. And these two cases provide examples about how the courts will consider the issue of intent. And that is the intent in question is that of Parliament when it created the law. So the objective component is where the court considers outside circumstances. It considers the matter before and at the time of making the law. So in this sense, it's very much along the lines of the purposive approach to statutory interpretation. And when we talk about the purposive approach to statutory interpretation, what is the case that immediately comes to mind? It almost comes down to an acronym. Blue Sky. Blue Sky. That's it, Project <laughs> Blue Sky. So that's always the go-to case. I think, and I'll keep mentioning that pretty much every week. So determining the purpose relies on considering the parliamentary intent. So even though these cases deal with unrelated facts and different legislation, they are examples of where the courts considered the objective intent of parliament. So if you have a question relating to objective intent, always a good idea to refer particularly to Maxwell and Murphy, I think. Now, any questions then about how you would go about answering that first question in last year's assessment, if called upon to do so now? and this issue of objective intent. No problems, all good? All right. Um, so just um, to follow up on those thoughts, the, um, the statutory purpose is, if, if you like, is the object and it focuses on why legislation is needed, 
So therefore, there's a, a degree of the mischief rule associated with this. And the who is directed to who this is um, directed towards. So we have to always, there's a series of um, W words that you can ask yourself when answering a question about statutory interpretation. Who, where, why, what, when. They're, they're always key words. If you're stuck for answering a question on statutory interpretation, maybe you can always ask yourself those questions and it might give you a train of thought. Now, another important case that you probably need to consider, maybe pop into your toolkit, is Lacey against the Attorney General. This is um, Attorney General of Queensland, 2011, 242 CLR. And um, that case is authority for the general proposition that statutory purpose may be identified by reference to the common law and the statutory rules. So at the start, I said, within that broader context, historical, etc., you must consider the common law, which includes equity, and the statutory rules, which includes regulations, etc. cetera. Um, so therefore, the authority for that proposition would be Lacey. There's always a good, good authority. In other words, the statute doesn't exist independently of these things. So when you're thinking about intention, you're asking yourself, what needs to be done to meet the purpose? So what was Parliament seeking to do to meet the purpose when it enacted the legislation? And you have to consider how it was implemented. So the aim is to determine and give effect to the intention as disclosed in the language of the statute, having regard to the applicable common law and statutory rules of construction. I've mentioned Lacey is a good authority for that proposition. Another one, this is a much older uh, case, but still relevant, is Dixon against Todd, 1904, 1 CLR, 320. Dixon against Todd, 1904, 1 CLR, 320. The reason I'm mentioning these things is that when you're developing your toolkit, you need to have some useful quotes and you need to have some authority for propositions. You'll hear that a lot in courts. So if a barrister, for example, states something by way of the legal position applicable to a case, it's very common for a court to, to respond by saying, what's your authority for that proposition? And that's lawyer talk for, give me a case, give me a statute, give me a practice direction, give me a regulation, give me something that I can use to accept the justification that what you're telling me is true. So when you're answering a, a legal problem, it is typical for you, in just, not just in statutory interpretation, but across all the units that you cover, make a statement of law, but always attempt to state an authority for your proposition is the term that we use. Any questions about that? All good? So what I'm saying is make sure that in your toolkit you have authorities for each of your propositions. You don't need a whole string of them. So you will actually be marked down if you give me 10 cases as authority for a single proposition, where in reality, there is a lead case and the others are simply examples of it being implemented or used. So give me the lead case, the, the important statute, maybe two cases if you have to. All right, all good? Now, can, can I assume that everyone has now read the second question in the examination from last year, which was to do with the Work Health and Safety Act. Has everyone read that? Has anyone actually had a, an attempt at answering it? Or is it too early? You've been worried about assessments and assignments. All right, now that's fine. So I do want you to start doing this. I want you to look at that question and see if you could answer it. Bearing in mind that you had three hours to answer it last year, um, and uh, that's the standard that I need you to get to now as quickly as possible. So to do that, you need to consider the Work Health and Safety Act 2011. 
I'm not saying this will be the statute upon which we base this year's question. It is very likely that I will select a statute for you, um, but it probably won't be that. But working through last year's um, problem would be a good way of preparing for this year's, if you understand what I mean. So that question, and I'll briefly introduce it, involved you being a lawyer in private practice. Now that's a scenario that I use a lot. I appreciate that many of you won't actually practice in law and those that do won't necessarily pr practice in private practice. But don't be concerned about the nature of the question. It's just a convenient way of asking you to provide an answer. And typically people um, go to lawyers asking for specific answers and um, part of the, the rationale behind the, the style of question is to say, I want you to explain the law, but not in an essay style. I want you to explain the law in a style that leads to a very clear conclusion and statement. Yes, no, for whatever it might be. Whatever the answer is, well, I want you to do that. The problem with asking essay style questions is that it gives you an opportunity to present general propositions but not necessarily lead to a conclusion, not necessarily have to go through that analysis to the point where you use the flow chart, for example, in, the, in Sanson or use your toolkit. What I want you to do is look at a factual scenario, look at some legislation, consider statutory interpretation principles and give me a conclusion. I don't care if the conclusion is different to the one that I've arrived at, and I don't care if it's different to what somebody else arrived at, provided you've worked your way through it uh, and you've given a conclusion, you've made a call, it doesn't necessarily have to be the right answer because there is not probably not going to be a right answer. Does that make sense? So think of that as some freedom that you can provide a completely wrong answer and still get top marks. Okay, if that makes sense. It's not maths here, it's not physics. So in that question um, for last year, you were a wor lawyer working in a private practice. Your supervising partner asks you to review a new matter. Your client is the state of Queensland. Your client is considering prosecuting an individual who was director of a company, it was a construction company. The evidence suggested that this individual engaged in action that caused industrial manslaughter. That was the new legislation last year. The victim was an, in, an employee who died immediately from an industrial accident and the investigations indicated that he may have exposed himself to risk of serious injury. Perhaps it was even reckless when as to the risk. Another version was that um, the supervisor, the person being considered for prosecution, encouraged to the point of directing this person to undertake the specific task that led to his death. Therefore, she may have exposed the victim to the risk of serious injury. Um, so the question is about considering the Work Health and Safety Act, consider the parts of the legislation that might be relevant, and your brief is to consider the factual circumstance only from the perspective of statutory interpretation. So even though there might be elements of say employment law or contract law, I'm not looking for that in an answer to a statutory interpretation question. You can add it in, but don't emphasize it, don't spend much time on it. So do you understand the basic scenario around that second question from last year's examination? and the tasks that I require of you. We'll just touch on this a little bit more and the idea of this is to get you going because I really do want you to work through this over the next three or four weeks. What's the first phase? I think we touched on this last week, but when you're considering a statutory interpretation question, you're looking at the facts, trying to determine an answer What's the first phase of your inquiry? Jurisdiction? Yes. I like it. Yes, Gareth? Oh, sorry, that was Tammy. It says identification? Yes. And 
you're both right because in my view jurisdiction is a subset of identification so if you're watching this as a recorded session and you're saying I don't understand what jurisdiction is I don't understand what identification phase is we need you to do some extra work catch up um, sorry to be blunt but you've just got to get on top of this now and this is really important because it's part of your toolkit this is the toolkit so identification phase um, involves jurisdiction Gareth what do we mean by jurisdiction Uh, the act, the legislation that the um, it comes under. Yes. <coughs> okay. Generally speaking, when we talk about jurisdiction, we talk about a tribunal's ability to or authority to deal with the matter. In other words, you'll hear this often. Um, does you know, for example, does a magistrate's court have jurisdiction to grant a divorce to a separating couple? Now, I think we all know the answer to that. The answer is, of course, no. The magistrate's court doesn't have jurisdiction to make that order. Um, does the, uh, the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal in its minor civil disputes jurisdiction have the ability to send someone to jail? The answer is no, they don't have jurisdiction for that. So when we're talking about jurisdiction, we're really talking about, as Gareth says, the legislation but in the context of, does that legislation apply in the current factual circumstances? So jurisdiction is a, is, can be one of, two, one of two things. It can either be, does this court or tribunal have the lawful authority to make a decision about this? But when we're talking about statutory interpretation and jurisdiction, we're talking about, does this particular piece of legislation cater for and apply to the current factual circumstances. In other words, if I gave you this factual circumstance and I said, um, your partner asks you to consider the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, Commonwealth, uh, relevant to this circumstance, then the first thing you've got to do is say, well, as part of the identification phase, I have to ask myself, does this Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act apply to the current factual circumstances? And the answer will be no, it doesn't. So that's going to be the end of the problem, isn't it? So you can, you can almost assume that the, the act that I call upon you to consider for the factual circumstances will apply um, but you've got, to, you've got to go through that exercise. You've got to give it a tick. Now, if I was really mean in the assessment, given you've got 29 hours, not three, I may not give you the act. I may ask you to find the act in order to determine whether it applies to the current circumstance. And I could easily do that in the current, um, you know, for, the, for question number two, I could say your supervising partner says, something like i know there's some legislation that's relevant to this situation can't remember the name but make sure you find it do you see what i mean um all right so number one part of identification does the act apply in the current factual circumstances then once you've identified that the act does apply what's the next step as part of the identification phase is it in force? Is it in force? So what do we mean by in force, Tammy? Um, the commencement date. So what, what was the actual royal assent? Has there been any amendment act? Is it um, repealed? Um, I would go into all of those areas. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yes, you've got to determine whether the act is in force. And you've also got to determine whether this particular section of the Act is in force because it's a trap for young players in statutory interpretation to firstly not consider the date of the factual circumstance and compare it with the date of assent for the legislation because there's got to be a match there. But then you've just got to watch that some pieces of legislation are a bit tricky 
in that the date of ascent is different for different sections within the same act. It's a bit obscure, but it's the sort of thing that examiners like to pick on just to trick you up. So make sure that you look for those issues, as Tammy said correctly, identify whether the act is in force at the relevant time. In order to do that, you need to know the date of ascent, you need to know when the act commenced, and you need to consider whether particular sections of the act commenced. And always, if you're answering a question of this na nature, please support your answer. Think to yourself, every time you make a statement that I respond by saying, what is your authority for that proposition? You've got to support the answer. Um, now, that doesn't have to always be a case because when you're determining the date of ascent, it might be that you refer back to whatever it is that you refer to. Does that make sense? All right. So first, Tammy and Gareth say that you've got to go through this identification phase to consider the jurisdiction and determine whether or not the particular act and or the individual sections apply. So Tammy and Gareth, from where did you draw that information that the first step is identification? I just got it from the um, Sanson's methodology. I exactly. just went through that process. Okay. And when you say Sanson's methodology, are you talking about the flow chart in the inside back cover of the book? Yes. Okay. That's the easy guide, isn't it? Um, and that may well form a big part of the material. So that's what um, Gary pointed to previously. For those of you watching the recorded session, wondering how we're coming up with these things, it's in the inside cover of the book. It's also dealt with extensively in the commentary. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be what you choose. So in your toolkit, you may look at something different. So what's the next stage after you've done, gone through that identification phase? We're all looking at the book, book now, aren't we? What's the next phase? Oh, sorry. Well, we also have to consider no, um, the operative provisions, don't we? So we've got to identify what are the operative provisions, identify the section or subsection that the, in this case, the prosecutors re could rely upon and consider whether they may charge with an offence or offence. So once we've been through the identification phase, we've considered the operative provisions. What's the next phase? And Amy says the context and the purpose. Yes, always. We need to go through an exploration phase, don't we? All right, so exploration phase, what does that mean? What do we mean by the exploration phase? How do you describe it? Tammy says it's, the, uh, Amy says it's the context and the purpose. Yes, which is really what we're talking about largely tonight. So when you, extrinsic materials is a part of it, yes. That will assist you as part of the exploration phase. So when you're interpreting legislation, you need to consider the statutory interpretation principles. So what that means is we consider the ordinary meaning of the words. We consider the broader context as Gary identified correctly. And as Amy suggested, we need to consider the context of, and purpose. And we do that by considering intrinsic materials and then we consider extrinsic materials. So Rhonda said, consider the extrinsic materials. Gara says, what does the legislation, in, what, what is the intent, what is it intended to achieve? We know what intrinsic materials are, don't we? Yes? Would you also look at making sure that you read the act as a whole? Yes, absolutely. And I think, I always think of reading the act as a whole is part of the intrinsic material. To me, it's the first stage of, in, of considering the intrinsic material. And then from there, we look at 
the objects clause, the purpose clause. We look at the preamble, if there is one, for the older acts. We look at the definitions clause, yes. Yeah. And the headings. Headings are often overlooked because the headings give you the roadmap on what they're trying to achieve. What is the intent of the legislation? Look at the headings. Get an idea from that. Um, Gary says that we need to do this within the broader context of the common law, including equity, and we need to consider the old literal golden and mischief rules. I agree with all that. So you see, there's a bit of a risk with statutory interpretation that it all becomes a bit of a, a mush of information, doesn't it? It just becomes, you know, unstructured, um, a bit like blancmange. We need to have some structure. So that's part of the reason that I'm asking you to look at the second question from last year's exam is to start to train your mind in terms of the structure and build this um, uh, information that you're building for your second assessment as well. And there is a lot to consider and it's a matter of yeah, structuring it, putting it into some sort of logical order. But it's got to be a logical order that works for you. And not everyone is going to choose the same quote or the same authority for a proposition or even the same order necessarily. There's some basic rules, but there's a lot of flexibility there. And you see that when you read cases about statutory interpretation. Judges don't always follow a script strictly. They have their own ways of doing things and, and so should you. I think I noticed that a lot with the whole blue sky thing is that there's still, like when you go into it a little bit deeper, there's still so much discussion, although like, you know, police, Project Blue Sky might be the um, the leading case. There's still so much discussion since that case, given that it is, you know, a 98 case. There's still been a lot that's been talked about since. Do we revert back? Do we go forward with a new meaning? Like, I just think that still, like, you know, at the end of the day, there's still so much more to be explored with the whole concept of statutory interpretation. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yep. Yeah. And because it's relatively new in a way. I know that some of the cases go back a long way. I know the Acts Interpretation Act, Commonwealth is a very old piece of legislation. But bear in mind that we had really an explosion of legislation through the 70s and 80s. Up until then, most of our law was based on common law and precedent. And now so much more of it is based on the interpretation of statutes. When I went through university, we did not have a subject called statutory interpretation. Now it's a, it's a key subject. Um, we had maybe a week um, on literal rule, mischief rule, and uh, the golden rule. And that was it. All right, so the exploration phase, we do that. We, th we consider the intrinsic, the extrinsic materials. We consider the purpose of the legislation. And we then move on to the next phase, which is the application phase. And here we're looking at um, determining things like deficiencies and evidentiary provisions that might assist in the scenario. So don't overlook and don't uh, overlook evidentiary provisions. So there might be some provisions that require you to um, prove certain things in a certain way, or there might be some provisions that deem proof to be um, presumed in, a, in certain scenarios. I mean, for example, if you're pulled, up, pulled over for um, drink driving and you know there's a, a reading from the machine, there's a presumption that the machine is operating and was operated correctly, at the time the reading was taken. So that's kind of an evidentiary provision that you need to consider. So build that into your flowchart. I think your flowchart, I think your toolkit will be much more extensive than, than Michelle Sanson's flowchart, as good as it is. So the application phase then is um, uh, what precisely do people need to prosecute? What do they need to prove? And here's something that's overlooked, who will prosecute? Sometimes there are provisions that refer to that um, and there may be some prosecutorial guidelines. So when I talk about guidelines, I really want you to broaden your reading and your thinking to think beyond legislation, beyond case laws, into things like um, prosecutors' guidelines 
um, which are published on websites, to look at practice directions, to look at bench books, to look at um, regulations, things of that nature. So keep it quite broad when you're considering the application phase. And then in the question that I've uh, presented last year, there were some further specific questions, change of timeframes, etc. <clears throat> so do you understand what I'm getting at by asking you to look at that question? Um, I think it's important because as you read through that question, you consider the answers, um, it will affect the way in which you go about preparing your toolkit as well as preparing you better for the third assessment. When I talk about the toolkit, it's really the way in which you go about answering this question. So two and three work in very closely together. Assessment two and the final assessment number three. Any questions about what I'm trying to achieve? I hope I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, but I hope it makes sense. With regards to the application phase, is that where you basically pull apart the elements and actually then grind down into a bit like a, a legal problem? Exactly. That's it. But you're even going beyond that because in the application phase, there is a practical element to it. In other words, you often need to, as part of the application, you need to identify in the, in the case of a potential prosecution, who will prosecute and in what court will the prosecution be brought? Will it be indictable or is it sum summary? If it's a civil matter and you're dealing with the application phase, you're getting down to some practicalities here. And that is again, what is the court? What are the jurisdictional limits? Are there time frames? Are there limitations that need to be considered? within the context of applying this legislation and um, are there any evidentiary requirements which means that you need to look at things like practice directions. Do you, do you know what I mean by a practice direction? I keep saying it but people may not know what I mean by that. So I'm going to ask you to do some research. Work out what is a practice direction because I'll keep talking about them and do so within the context primarily of the Supreme District Courts, Magistrates Court in the Queensland jurisdiction, and the, say, the Federal Court and the Family Court in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. So practice directions. Does everyone know what I mean by bench books? Keep talking about those as well. Bench books are those things which are written specifically actually for, for judges, but they're published. So it's the way in which a judge has a template, or it's the template that the judge might choose to use when explaining things to juries. So bench books are a great resource. So you'll often see in a question that I write that I'll ask you to consider legislation, regu regulations, case law, practice directions, all, all of those things. I think it might have even been built into that question last year. So you've got to understand what those things are and importantly, how to find them. So I'll get you to start doing that research now. All right. Um, so that's just about it for this evening. Are there any questions? A um, question from Gary. Mills and Meeking looks into um, those rules and does the Penalties and Sentences Enforcement Act apply? Yes. Have a look at that. Penalties and sentences is always important. So when you're answering a statutory interpretation question, of course, the Acts Interpretation Acts, Commonwealth and State, will always be important. But there are some, some other go-to pieces of legislation. So in Queensland, the Penalties and Sentences Act is always an important one to consider. All right. All good? Okay. Well, thanks for your attendance. We'll wrap it up for this evening. Please ask through Q&A. Good luck if you haven't yet completed and uploaded your first assessment. If you have, good on you. And um, uh, start to work towards the second and now third assessment. And uh, we'll, we'll take, pick up uh, next week. All the best. We'll see you then. Bye.